Coming up on DTNS, Evernote's former CEO helps liven up your video conference. Thunderbolt 4 could double your 4K monitors. And as we work from home and become our own IT manager, Seth Rosenblatt helps us keep all that work and personal data separate and secure. This is the Daily Tech News for Wednesday, July 8th, 2020 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lean. From, from Salt, Lake Salt Lake City, City I'm Scott, Scott Johnson. Johnson. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. As I mentioned, joining us from the Parallax, Seth Rosenblatt back on the show. Welcome back, Seth. Hi, everyone. I'm here in sunny San Francisco. Ah, it's good it, to have it's you. It's sunny. <laughs> it's sunny in San Francisco. It's an yeah. auspicious sign. Uh, well, or, or a sign of the apocalypse. Could be yeah, both. one of the two. Uh, we were just talking about our favorite pizza and pizza chains on Good Day Internet. If you want to get that wider conversation, become a member. Patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. Samsung announced its Galaxy Unpacked event will take place on August 5th at 10 a.m. Eastern Time. Samsung is expected to announce the new Note phones and a follow-up to the Galaxy Fold and Galaxy Flip. Arm announced it plans to spin off its two LOT businesses to SoftBank, which bought Arm back in 2016. Arm will instead focus on its efforts on the semiconductor IP business. Pending additional review from the company's board, plus standard regulatory reviews, Arm says it expects the shift to be complete before the end of September, which is pretty quick. The company will uh, keep its business on the compute IP aspect of the LOT. IOT, Internet of Things. Oh, I say L, sorry, Internet yep. of Things. I knew that. Yep. Uh, Korea's ET News reports Samsung may not include chargers with its smartphone starting in 2021. Many people already have compatible chargers, and the move might reduce some costs. It would also reduce waste as some unused chargers get thrown away and put Samsung in the same boat as Apple, which may do the same thing. LinkedIn added a new feature to user profiles that lets you record a 10-second audio clip of how to pronounce your own name actually would come in handy. You know, you're making connections. You want to be polite. Recordings can be added through the Android and iOS apps and played back on mobile and desktop. Popular game streamer Tyler Ninja Blevins, mostly known as Ninja, who notably left Twitch for Microsoft's Mixer service before Mixer abruptly shut things down, but still paid out his contract, to fold into Facebook gaming. He streamed a Fortnite session on YouTube Wednesday, kind of his first big return, along with fellow streamer Dr. Lupo, Tim the Tatman, and Courage. 100,000 people watch that stream. Uh, this is Ninja's next, uh, sorry, first ever stream on YouTube, although no potentially exclusive contracts were announced at this time. A job listing from Twitter indicates the company's building some kind of subscription platform. The job listing says, quote, we are a new team, codenamed Griffin. We are building a subscription platform, one that can be used by other teams in the future. This is a first for Twitter. Job listing does not suggest what kind of subscription service this might be. Uh, this, I, I really want to know. <laughs> oh boy, do I want to know. Reuters reports that the U.S. Federal Trade Commission and the U.S. Department of Justice are investigating allegations that TikTok has not, had not fulfilled a February 2019 agreement to protect user privacy. Specifically, in that agreement, TikTok promised to delete videos and personal information about users age 13 and younger, among other promises. TikTok says it accommodates users younger than 13 in a limited app experience with additional safety and privacy protections. And Microsoft announced several new features for its Teams product. Together mode, for instance, puts participants on a shared background. The idea is to try to make you feel like you're in the same room. Dynamic view gives moderators more control over how shared content is displayed, like you can put Pat from accounting in their spreadsheet in front of everyone. And Teams is also getting reaction emojis, poll questions, photo and video filters, and more. All right, let's talk about a new way to video conference. Well, you're not going to believe me, but the name is mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's a new virtual camera that can be used with Zoom, <laughs> Google Meet, YouTube, and other video streaming services. Announced its private beta, private beta Tuesday. This is head up by Phil Lippin, or Libin rather, co-founder and former CEO of Evernote. Remember Evernote? Get your whole elephant there, remembers everything goes beyond similar services that lets participants change their backgrounds, but also manipulate deck slides and zoom in and zoom out of a participant's image itself to control the focus of the frame, not unlike a more traditional newscast, if you will. Uh, mm -hmm. Also also allows interactive presentations. Uh, it says it includes recorded video slides that can be advanced by the audience and overall be played and paused. 
mm -hmm, is invite only for right now. It's on <laughs> Mac, Mac OS Catalina with mobile and Windows versions expected in the coming months. Now, the name may be ridiculous, but what I saw in that video looked really cool and very promising. No, it's it. And I, I don't want to laugh because that's the name of the company. And it is a palindrome, so I will give it that. Yeah, but four M's, one on, two on each side of the H. Easy that's to right. And, you know, and Phil Libin, uh, he, you know, kind of made fun of the fact that he's like, it's a silly name. We know it. You can say it when you're chewing food and without having to open your mouth. You know? So it's like, you know, they're, they're just having some fun with it. It's probably something about the fact that there aren't a lot of names for things anymore. But this aside, this is very cool. And it's not that, I mean, listen, we, we have experimented with a variety of meeting style software for, for this show. Um, I've definitely done group Zoom calls and some others for, you know, maybe family and friends related stuff, but nothing that really, you know, struck me as, oh, I could do like a fun YouTube creative show using these tools based on what I've seen that seem pretty easy. Not that you can't do this in other ways, but it either requires post-production or more kind of clunky measures. So it's invite only. I asked for an invite. I'm on the list. Who knows when I'll ever get it, but... Uh, but I'm I'm looking forward to trying it out. Dear Phil Libin, we will all use it on an episode of Daily Tech News Show. If you yeah, Phil, the come on. <laughs> Get us at the front of the pack. Well, not only the that, only I, was, I was thinking about this from the creative perspective of like somebody who's trying to do live streams on Twitch all the time. Um, I control all of those aspects. If this tool is simple enough to use, it changes the game for how I can do that stuff in real time. But I have questions about platform. Will this be a virtual camera I can use in any software like OBS, like Streamlabs, something like that? Like there are a few few little dangly things that I, I want to hear more about. Yeah, they, they I mean, they made a point of this isn't con video conference software itself. It's stuff you use to put your image into Zoom and Google Meet and YouTube, right. which does sound like a virtual camera. But also I've used those kinds of things before and they are buggy as all get out. So oh, I'm man. very I mean, curious snap, if snap this would camera? really works. Yeah. I'd, I'd be using Snap Camera right now if, oh, it, yeah. if it didn't, you know, poop the bed every time I tried to do it on top of some other service. Yeah. I'd be a rabbit or, <laughs> you know, I'd have rainbow eyes or something. I don't know. So are they are they just looking for free beta user, if for, for, for yeah. you know, for free beta feedback? Right now. Well, and, and even when it comes out be... in, in the autumn, it's going to be a freemium model, I think. Yeah. Well, mm-mm. <laughs> mm -mm, says Seth. Nope. Nope. says not yet All right. ready. We have some more people uh, saying, mm -mm. civil rights experts Laura Murphy and Megan Cassace released an 89-page report on their independent audit of Facebook's practices and policies. Facebook asked them to do it, but Facebook didn't have anything in the making of the report. The audit notes, quote, this report outlines a number of positive and consequential steps that the company has taken, but at this point in history, the auditors are concerned that those gains could be obscured by the vexing and heartbreaking decisions Facebook has made that represent significant setbacks for civil rights. So they're saying Facebook did a lot of good stuff, and then the decisions they've made most recently regarding particularly uh, certain posts, uh, including posts from the president, uh, disappoint the auditors. Also, in, uh, in at the same time as this report came out, leaders of the groups that are promoting an ad boycott of Facebook met with Mark Zuckerberg and called the meeting a disappointment. Jessica Gonzalez, co-CEO of Free Press, said the group's quote, didn't hear anything today to convince us that Zuckerberg and his colleagues are taking action. And this group very particularly has said, we want Facebook to do more. So again, kind of echoing what's in the report. Maybe what they've done up until, you know, earlier this year was fine, but we need them to do more. And Facebook doesn't seem to want to do that. Uh, one hope people might have is that the independent oversight board that Facebook is setting up might help with this because that oversight board can take appeals from users about moderation decisions. Uh, but that oversight board announced today that it will not be ready until late fall, likely putting it after the US presidential election. So it's not gonna be around to affect this for a while. So, so really what's going on here is Facebook's digging in, it sounds like to me and saying, we have done what we're going to do and we're, we're not willing to take this any farther at the moment. Yeah, the, the takeaway for me was not uh, whether or not they should or shouldn't or whatever the political stance of the of the of any of the parties are. It's that the statement here seems to be, hey, we're cool for now. We're not going to we're not going to move in too many directions. We're going to kind of 
be Facebook. The way we want to be Facebook is this for right now. And you're not going to come in here and tell us any different. And I guess I'm not totally surprised by that. Um, you know, they probably don't want to swing too far in any direction at this point. Well, uh, every company is going to reach a line where they say, well, well, now we would be interfering. Now we think we would right. be doing more harm than good. And this is where Facebook thinks its line is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, we, I mean, we, we've, what we've seen over, over the years is that whether we're talking about Facebook or Twitter, uh, you know, or any other social media service, that they don't make changes unless there is like a howitzer pointed at their head. And uh, I'm not particularly hopeful, uh, you know, that, that the changes that Facebook does feel compelled to make at the end of whatever gun is being pointed at them uh, are compelling because what we've seen is they take – these uh, after-the-fact actions, right? They only started doing the most uh, uh, gentle of reviews of posts uh, after the 2016 election. They were doing a little bit before, but it really wasn't until after, and everyone was very upset with them for how uh, they dealt with things that were posted on Facebook or ads that were bought on Facebook. Um, we're still fighting with Facebook over ads, even when Twitter has said, actually, you guys are right, we're gonna make some changes. So I'm, I'm wondering if one of the things that may ha be more impactful is, a, is some kind of regulation that says that social media companies must make user data portable. So instead of saying people are locked in and, you're gonna ha and we're going to regulate how you deal with people, in, you know, uh, uh, consumers uh, internally on your networks, you just have to make it so that, pe so that consumers can take their data elsewhere. Um, you don't like Facebook, you can go to uh, we I can't remember uh, Weeby or whatever the you know one of these new uh, social uh, media startups are, just so that they have a little bit of a leg up, right? So that so that you can say, hey, I took my data, my friends are all going to take their data too, and we're all going to be here with things that we posted in the past. Yeah, I, I don't know if it even would take regulation. I, we're seeing Facebook move toward transparency, so continued pressure might get them there. What I would really like to see, regulation or not, however yeah. we get there, is the ability for uh, something like MIT Solid to catch on and say, your data will always be yours, no matter where you are, and you can decide who has access to it and who doesn't, and change those permissions as you go along. Mm. Well, something that might be good news a little bit more across the board is that Qualcomm announced the Snapdragon 865 Plus chips. Plus versions of Snapdragon are usually higher clocked versions offered, often targeted at gaming. The 865 Plus is 10% faster with a 3.1 gigahertz CPU and a GPU around 660 megahertz. The Plus also adds Fast Connect 6900, which brings peak speeds of up to 3.6 gigabyte. Uh, gigabits per second, and Wi-Fi 6E's expanded spectrum, making it work better in crowded areas. And that's actually a really big deal, depending on where you are. Lenovo and Asus will release products using the Snapdragon 865+, Plus, and Asus will unveil the Asus ROG Phone 3 using this new chip on July 22nd. Yeah, so I mean, th this is if you're into gaming on mobile uh, and and having more powerful gaming as gaming gets better and better, uh, these plus releases of Snapdragon are always good news. Uh, the the previous plus round uh, brought brought a lot of game focused stuff, and this one's no exception. That Wi-Fi six E stuff though, we'll we'll have a uh, an episode explaining Wi-Fi six and six E coming up next week on Know a Little More, and and that really will do a lot in areas where, like a stadium, where they provide free Wi-Fi, and you got a lot of people using a lot of data at once in a, in a small area. 6E is going to be great for that. Yeah, well, especially via the VR and, um, and uh, advancements we're making in portability and size and speed, graphics capability, VR is going to benefit a lot from. Yeah, you know, that's true, too. Well. Yep. 9 to 5 Mac reports, references in the code for iOS 11 beta 2. Uh, 14. What I say? 14. IOS 14, yeah. Oh, that's weird. iOS 14, <laughs> beta, too. Uh, a lot of numbers. To a function to let iPhone users scan a QR code to make payments with Apple Pay. The feature doesn't work with an image, uh, doesn't work but an image gave instructions on how to use it. QR codes could be used to generate uh, or could be generated by the wallet app itself. Uh, the feature is in the public system API, implying it will work with third-party apps. So get ready to do it like the rest of the world's been doing it for a while. Yeah, oh, right. Oh, man, sure. I... Yeah, I, I love, you know, the, it's funny, we were talking before the show is like, there were a lot of breathless, like, look what this hidden new functionality in iOS 14 is going to offer people just because 
it wasn't part of the stage, uh, you know, keynote from WWTC, but it's not, uh, well, first of all, I think it's a great idea. It's not super surprising because I am an enthusiastic user of Apple Pay at a select few places that take it. Uh, it, you know, there's sort of a point of sale thing to deal with. Um, I notably where I used to live had a grocery store that was just like the best in every way possible, but they only took Samsung pay and it was just like the bane of my existence. And, you know, there is, there's a little bit of like, especially not wanting to touch things as much as possible. And I've really thought about this in not just grocery stores, but just anywhere lately is like, just, you know, being able to scan something with your own device, you know, you're there, you're wearing your mask, you're not punching in a pin number or otherwise touching something just adds a little bit more security that I think is, is the timing is, is very ripe for this sort of thing. And, and it's crazy that this hasn't happened. Like I know friends of mine who run small businesses in San Francisco and they have storefronts and whatever, where they have to interact with people on a regular basis are very, very anxious about dealing with cash, even though there is a problem where, you know, you, you can't ban cash because there are certain people who only have cash. The vast majority of people who do have smartphones should be able to use them. And why Apple and Google and Samsung aren't pushing as hard as they can to get, you know, uh, device compatibility and cross compatibility into stores ASAP is just utterly mind boggling. This is such an incredible moment for them. And it feels like you're watching the ball just sort of like roll down the gutter. Yeah. Um, and the QR codes would be a way to expand accessibility for Apple yeah. Pay, right? Because yeah. you, a, a merchant wouldn't have to get new equipment that works with NFC if they've got older equipment. It's a lot easier to set up a QR code, which is why it's the predominant way to pay for things in large parts of Asia. I mean, WeChat mm -hmm. in China uses the QR code system. In fact, there are places, uh, and I think it was on the Phileas Club I heard, where they were saying not using QR codes to pay for things seems insecure to a lot right. of people in right. a lot of right. parts right. of the world. Right. So it's or, or just like just up. a very clunky way to do something when there's already a solution. Yeah. So so what what we've seen, if, if I can hang on this for one more second, is that it's often credit card companies that have been the blockers to tech adoption in the U.S. Uh, or at least in North America, where they're reluctant to to go, uh, in, you know, for uh, chip and pin cards. They're reluctant to go for have to pay with those cards, even though Europe and Asia, by and large, have had these services uh, for, for, for ages. So I, I, I mean, I haven't done any, any reporting or research into this recently, but I'd be very curious to see if we are seeing blocks from MasterCard and Visa and other uh, major payment companies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, it's a fair question. Uh, I'm, I'm curious as well. Uh, and last, as the USB 4 standard is about to launch with most of the advantages of Thunderbolt 3 inside, Intel released specs for Thunderbolt 4, uh, which adds things that USB 4 won't have. Uh, it is the same speed as both Thunderbolt 3 and USB 4 at 40 gigabits per second, but it can run, Thunderbolt 4 can, two 4K displays, supports PCIe data speeds up to 32 gigabits per second, that's twice Thunderbolt 3, and you can have a cable that's up to two meters long uh, and docks and monitors with up to four Thunderbolt 4 ports. That's up from two that you could do with Thunderbolt 3 on your docks. Uh, Thunderbolt 4 will use the USB-C connector still and support USB 4 and require at least one port on a computer support charging and wake from sleep by keyboard and mouse when a computer is connected to a Thunderbolt dock. Thunderbolt 4 also requires a protection against direct memory attacks, something that was optional in Thunderbolt 3. Now it's required if you want to call it Thunderbolt 4. And the controllers, which is where Intel makes its money, will ship to manufacturers later this year along with 11th gen Tiger Lake processors. Yay! I mean, yay, right? Like, that's kind of it. It's like, oh, okay. I mean, I mean if I can afford to get a machine that can have a pricey Thunderbolt 4 controller in it, this sounds great. I want great. it. Yeah. yeah, but the funny thing is, the only advantage for me, and I'm using Thunderbolt 3 a lot for a lot more stuff than I thought I was getting, um, would be the extra display. But right now, I don't think I need an extra 4K display. So obviously, somebody needs this. But weirdly, I'm kind of happy to hear that the 40 gigabyte per second speed is still the same, and I'm I'm still okay. I'm not completely obsolete for the next yeah. two years. So I, right. I think a lot of people are going to look at this and wonder if uh, Apple, moving to ARM, will also just move to USB 4, uh, because even though Thunderbolt 4 has some advantages, they're not huge advantages, and it's certainly cheaper to just use open standard of USB 4 than it is to pay Intel to license Thunderbolt 4.
Okay. Hey, folks, if you want to get all the tech headlines each day in about five minutes, be sure to subscribe to dailytechheadlines.com. All right, more people working from home. More people have a mix of work and personal data sloshing around on their devices and their networks because of that. And that's something you need to keep an eye on. Seth, how can we keep our work and our home data separate and secure? Well, if you've got enough uh, uh, scratch and you don't mind the effort, create an entirely separate network, get entirely new devices, and you know, don't don't mix uh, your your uh, home milk with your work meat. Keep it kosher. But that's not really feasible for just about anybody. So, uh, barring that, you know, uh, th th this is something that I've encountered uh, a lot of different takes on from cybersecurity experts. As with most things involving COVID, people are uh, you know figuring out what the new paradigm is in real time. Um, so things that you know people were were advising early in March uh, probably have shifted a little bit as we've settled into this uh, uh, constant work from from home situation. Um, I think one thing that a lot of people working from home really need to think about is uh, how old their home Wi-Fi router is. Uh, Wi-Fi routers are terrible. Um, I wrote a story back in uh, 2019 uh, on new research then showing that Wi-Fi router security had actually decreased from the early aughts to uh, the late teens. Um, that's not good. Um, and yet, you know, we do now have Wi-Fi routers that will have uh, patches, uh, you know, updated automatically, a lot like your phone or your computer does. Um, and that's really important. Uh, but get a new Wi-Fi router, absolutely. Um, make sure you're using two-factor authentication on all of your services. Um, make sure that when you're using it, that unless there's no other option than the SMS uh, texted code for your two-factor, uh, use an authenticator app um, or ideally a YubiKey or Titan key, something like that. Um, use a password manager. Uh, I use 1Password. I use YubiKey and Authy as my authenticator app. Um, these are all things that you know we've been hearing for years, and and good IT departments, uh, you know, in in from employers will be mandating. Um, but it's really more critical now than ever, you know, especially as people are working from home and are looking at data that they're generating for their employer, uh, you know, as as you know potentially uh, mission critical data for their careers. Um, so you need to be really careful about how you deal with things. Uh, a VPN is good, but not the only thing that you need. Yeah, I think a lot of times uh, VPN, uh, the, the, article, the argument with VPN is a little bit like the argument with masks. It does protect you, but it could also give you a false sense of security. You need to do other things along yeah. with it, right? Uh, you need to wash your hands and use a password manager. Uh, so and if, socially distance. Support. Yeah, yeah, so <laughs> definitely distance your data. Uh, uh, what about, if you mentioned the router, like if I just mm -hmm. bought a new router yesterday, I'm probably in good shape, right? But mm -hmm. how should I evaluate whether I need a new <laughs> router or not? Yeah, I mean, for, for one thing, if your router, one of the challenges with routers is that they're pretty simple boxes. They they're not terribly expensive to make, they're commodity items, and they last forever, right? Most Wi-Fi routers will last a very, very long time. Um, and just because you bought it even yesterday doesn't mean it was, it was made this year. It could have been sitting on shelves for three years, for five years. And so there's extra due diligence that people need to do, consumers need to do before buying a new router. There's no question there. Um, so making sure that the router has been made recently, that it has, uh, uh, that, that it supports automatic updates, that you will get patches, that the patches are made in the first place. Um, and there's talk in the cybersecurity, cybersecurity community about making something like an energy star rating, some sort of like basic minimum standard of security that can be, you know, stuck onto things so mm -hmm. that you know that you're going to be getting patches on a regular basis, um, that you're going to be getting security updates for X period of time. Uh, and that will sort of help consumers, I think, if and when this thing actually happens, uh, figure out what the lifetime of these devices really should be. Um, but right now, you've got to really be cautious when you're buying stuff. 
check when it was made, check reviews, uh, and it's and it's a lot of burden on the consumer, which is unfortunate. And I feel like this is a place where enterprise IT can step in and start making recommendations. Yeah, yeah I mean, how- I, I, as somebody who, I, I don't know, I had a Linksys router that worked until finally I had a Comcast, uh, you know, connection that the Linksys router simply couldn't deal with. So I was mm-hmm. like, okay, I'm going to get a new router because I want, you know, my throughput to be as good as possible. But, you know, I didn't really think about any of that other stuff because I was like, I, I used to have it. It's fine. It works. You plug it in and you're good to go. I wasn't really at the time doing work from home, so it mattered less, but the mm-hmm. security issue was still the same. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, re- I actually think that more and more people – uh, should be asking their uh, their employer's IT department for advice on these things. See what they recommend, um, and if they don't have a recommendation, you know, get get some of your buddies at work together and and have people you know in on a group email saying, you know, we're not coming back to the office anytime soon. Uh, we need guidance on this. Um, you know, and depending on whom you work for, maybe, you know, if they're providing you with a phone or a laptop, they should also be providing you with a Wi-Fi router. Yeah. Certainly, they should be providing you with uh, uh, enterprise uh, uh, level password manager support, uh, two-factor authentication keys. These are not expensive things for, for businesses, and they will go such a long way to protecting corporate data. Yeah. And even if uh, they don't have the budget to replace all the routers, it, helping you assess whether that router is yeah. safe to use or not is important. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, one thing we'll provide you with is some pretty great discussion <laughs> in our Discord, which you can join by linking to a Patreon account at patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's check out the mailbag. Oh, let's do it. We got so many good mailbags. And thanks in advance to everybody who sent in cat photos and also a lot of dog photos because I asked you and you're great. Gary wrote in and said, your conversation with Kirsten Brazier yesterday reminded me of some frustrations of my old job. Until about three years ago, I did technical support for an unspecified company that manufactured secure console servers. I worked with folks from utilities, military organizations, city, state, and national governments, financial institutions, pharmaceutical companies, etc. They'd all call us about how some new CVE had just been issued, had to be fixed right now. Unfortunately, given the highly customized firmware in our products, upgrading to a new version of SSH usually took around six months of engineering work. Luckily for us, at the time, none of our competitors were any better at dealing with security issues. Most were worse. Then there were the folks running ancient VMS systems or something from the same era that were trying to meet modern security requirements. So we no longer have products that communicate uh, via X.25, LAT, token ring, nor do we know of anybody who does. I begged and pleaded with upper management and engineering to make our current and future products easier to patch until the day I retired, and it was frustrating. Yeah. Ah, Gary, thank you for, for, for sharing your pain. <laughs> we, we, we totally get it. It's good stuff. Yeah. And unfortunately, like his experience is stuff that I hear all the time, yeah. all the time from, from people who are either security experts or working in security engineering. Um, it's, it's a real, real challenge, you know? Well, yeah, you know, especially when someone's like, this is broken. We're, you know, we have to work. And you're like, well, that can't happen tomorrow <laughs> it's, already, yeah. it's already hard like uh, i was just thinking about how hard this already is to get done before in the before times in the before pandemic times imagine trying to have this stuff get done now like there's no it feels like the urgency gets pulled out of the sales a little bit mm-hmm. and that's also a bummer but yeah i feel for him this reminds me of the old offices i used to work in and it's giving me flashbacks <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, if we're in the after times, uh, we still have patrons at our master and grandmaster levels, and they're great, including Dan Dorado Hankins, John Johnston, and Chris Smith. Hey, thanks so much to Seth Rosenblatt for being with us today. Seth, it's so great to have you back. Let folks know where they can keep up with your work. Thank you. Yes. Uh, You can follow me on Twitter, at Seth R., and uh, the Parallax, which is the cybersecurity and privacy news site, which I uh, founded four and a half years ago now uh yeah it's crazy uh we you know we struggle it's independent journalism but uh you can follow us at the parallax uh that's p-a-r-a-l-l-a-x it's a great word learn it love it and uh thank you for having me on 
Absolutely. Uh, also, thanks to Scott Johnson. Scott mm. Johnson, uh, you've been a pretty busy man, so let folks know where they can uh, find out what, what the latest is. Well, there's a lot going on, and there's always stuff to be seen at frogpants.com, but I would recommend right now to check out support.currentgeek.com. Tom Merritt and I are putting together some of the best work we've ever done in a uh, really cool kind of long form curated uh, audio format that we're really, <laughs> really excited about. I can't wait for people to hear this thing. Uh, we tackle really cool subjects. Have you ever wondered where the word mana came from or mana? We learned we have to call it from now on and why it's so prominent in today's video games and board games and things. But back in the day, not so much. It came from a very weird place. We discuss all of that. We talk about theremins. We talk about wrestling. We talk about all sorts of cool things in this first season. And right now the Kickstarter's going. We are a little over the halfway point of being funded. You can go there now and check it out and see what all the rewards are and what might apply to you. Check it out at support.currentgeek.com. Folks, the Daily Tech News Show masks have shipped. I can prove it because I'm wearing one right now. If you would like to also be wearing one, you can do so. Head out to our store and get a DTNS logo on your face. DailyTechNewsShow.com slash store. I can say for sure that Tom wearing his DTNS mask looks like he's smiling. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very cool effect. Yeah, it's DTNS kind of, you know. It's uh, almost like a Karate Kid type thing. Anyway, our email address is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. We are live Monday through Friday at 4.30 p.m. Eastern. That's 2030 UTC. And you can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Yes, indeed. Security Week rolls on tomorrow. Justin Robert Young will be here along with the hosts of the CISO podcast, Mike Johnson and Alan Alford, on understanding InfoSec needs of a business. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>